So we're going to get started today. Thanks, everybody. joining us. Um, really excited to have this on the agenda today. Basically, go through some introductions, uh, give you some overview of what we do at um, CCCOER. Um, then we're going to talk about some specific research, talk about some strategies that you can employ um, at your campus, um, and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, I put a note in the chat if you can find the chat window and if at any time you want to leave a note there that would be great we like to kind of keep folks on mute when they're not asking a question just because of background noise so the chat works well for that i'll be i'll be monitoring that i know una and liz will be monitoring that as well um and then we've got some final announcements about upcoming events so our speakers today, do you all want to just introduce yourselves? Um, Philip Grimaldi? Sure, my name's Phil Grimaldi. I'm the uh, Director of Research at OpenStax. Hi, well, I'm super happy to be here. Virginia. Hi, I'm Virginia Clinton. I'm an Assistant Professor in the Department of Education, Health and Behavior at the University of North Dakota. And one of my main lines of research is open educational resources and their efficacy. Awesome. Um, so at CCC OER, you, you may know this already, but um, we, uh, the, we are a community of practice um, dedicated to promoting the adoption and development of open educational resources to enhance teaching and learning. So CCCOER was founded um, to support community the community college mission of open access um, by promoting OER as a low cost alternative um, to create to make instructional materials more affordable and accessible for students. So the main way that that happens is by you know the community of practice that you see through these webinars, through the listserv, through the website. Um, and various events that we host. Um, we also coordinate regional leadership and um, try to focus on promoting uh, student success. So members of CCCOER across uh, the country, uh, you can see the membership um, there. Um, there's 15 statewide members as well as these are uh, 90 members from 34 states so those are individual institutions um, and then this year we have two new member institutions trinity valley community college and butler community college so welcome trinity valley and butler so that's cool um, Do, if you haven't, if you don't already go there regularly, please check out the, our website. Um, some really great resources here. All of the webinars uh, are recorded and posted on the website. So this, um, this webinar will be recorded and um, posted there. Um, we have case studies, blogs, um, in particular, um, we have a, um, Diversity and Inclusion blog, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion blog series that's, uh, that we're doing right now. There's also a calendar of upcoming events, so make sure to check out the cccoer.org um, website. Okay, so coming back to the topic for today, I wanted to kind of go back to our guests, and if you could just talk a little bit more uh, about your research background, kind of um, your education, but also like what you've been studying and particularly how it intersects with OER research. Phil. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, um, uh, which means I essentially study the mind and mental processes. I specialize in learning processes in particular. Um, so, uh, I want to say I, I've been studying learning since I was an undergraduate uh, at Kent State University, working in various labs there. 
um, I did my graduate work at Purdue University, um, where I was doing more traditional theoretical members and switching more um, applied learning research. Um, along the way, uh, I made a lot of interesting friends, uh, one of which uh, was Rich Baranek, uh, who's the founder of OpenStax. And Rich invited me to come to Rice University and do a postdoc at Rice, uh, where we were doing uh, research kind of integrating cognitive sciences into um, the OpenStax technology and resources, and sort of also looking at ways to um, use cognitive psychology and cognitive sciences to inform uh, his area of research, which was um, machine learning, still is machine learning and kind of educational data mining. Um, after, uh, yeah, so being at OpenStax for a little bit, we start, we're doing a lot of research and that's more kind of traditional applied learning research. Um, and uh, so somewhere along the way, uh, my boss uh, and managing director of OpenStax, uh, uh, Daniel Williamson, we were in a meeting one day. And if you're familiar with OpenStax, um, one of our biggest kind of achievements really has been um, the the number of dollars we've actually saved students over the um, the years that we've been in existence and that's kind of been the number that we've used to sort of tout our value for a long time and then Daniel kind of noticed in the last few years that number although it's very important um, a lot of funders and people that are interested in this kind of area started asking the question well like okay, so you saved all this money, so what? What What else, what other kind of impacts can you see from giving students a free book? And so Daniel and I were in a meeting one day and he was like, you know, what, what can we do with the research wise? And kind of my knee jerk reaction was, well, look, I mean, so our objective, right, when we go out to create um, an open stacks book is to create that something that's essentially the same in terms of quality as something that's on the market and they're charging $400 for. So in many ways, if you're swapping out this $400 textbook for a textbook of equivalent quality that's free, um, from a cognitive, like from my perspective as a cognitive psychologist, I say, well, these two things should be equivalent. I, I don't know what I'm even researching here because I don't have a plausible um, reason to even think that there would be a difference. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I went and kind of looked at some of the existing research that was out there and um, started thinking a little bit more about um, ways in which OER might be unique or distinct from um, traditional materials. And that's kind of where my world is met with, um, with OER. And that's kind of like my my introduction introductory feel. We'll get into more of some of the stuff that I've done and we have been doing. And I'll turn it over to Virginia to introduce herself. Awesome. Yeah, Virginia. Yes. Yeah, so my background actually has some overlap with Phil's. Uh, my PhD was in educational psychology with a focus or a minor in cognitive science. And my training was very much related to how cognitive science could be applied to educational research. So I got trained not only in cognitive psychologies, research techniques, but also for education research more broadly. And in my career development, as I started teaching classes, you know, like many instructors, um, because I taught large enrollment uh, intro to psych courses, I was getting constantly bombarded by textbook publishers and was a little taken aback by it. So I very much get motivated from a cost perspective. Also talking to my students about how they flat out told me they could afford their books or they could afford food. They couldn't afford both. And, you know, when I heard about open uh, textbooks as an alternative and I looked into it, I figured as a somebody trained in education research and I have quite a bit of experience doing scholarship and teaching and learning in my classes, I should test. So I did, I found that the uh, learning was relatively equivalent between the two semesters. The withdrawal rate was lower with the open textbook and student perceptions were comparable. So I 
didn't really intend to continue with that, but I happened to connect with uh, John Hilton, who's a very, you know, big name in OA and encouraged me to present my findings at Open Education and to apply to the OER Research Fellows. And I, I just became aware that it was such an important field and that it involved a lot more than just free books, even though the free portion is in and, in and of itself pretty remarkable. You know, there are quite a few people who are concerned that if it's free or you know if there aren't the access fees that you have with commercial materials it can't be any good and yeah i i remember having commercial publishers tell me like well if you actually cared about your students you wouldn't use those open textbooks so wow. <laughs> i said well you know let's see what the data say and yeah that prompted my my focus and my research. A lot of my, my other main line is reading comprehension, specifically text comprehension, as far as like how you make connections and uh, how college students learn from reading. So studying textbooks has been, you know, an obvious area of focus for me, given my reading background. So um, that's, that's how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Great. I, I love hearing the stories. And um, I think it gives folks a, a picture of kind of where you all are coming at this and kind of how someone might approach OER research. Um, I'm noticing in the chat that we just have a ton of folks from all over the US and Canada. Una says about 80 people have joined in. So thanks so much for joining. Folks, if you're just joining us, we are working with a uh, Bill Grimaldi and Virginia Clinton, and we are talking about OER impact research. I'm Nathan Smith. So I want to turn to Phil. You mentioned, you know, how you got into this area and then, you know, this key question that you were asking yourself, I mean, what's the difference between an open textbook and a commercial textbook, given that they cover the same content, they're, they're modeled off the, off the same basic curriculum. What's the, the value difference between the two in terms of learning. Um, so you've written this paper in the last year that was published in the last year that um, I think is really interesting and addresses this question. You want to talk about what is the uh, access hypothesis and why should we care about it? Sure. Um, like you alluded to, uh, this, this all kind of started as sort of like a, a brainstorming exercise or a, a thought experiment, really. Um, which was to try and really identify what are the possible mechanisms that might be underlying a differences a difference between an OER adoption and a traditional commercial book. Um, and uh, my first open ed was sort of like a learning experience, trying to get a feel for what people are thinking, what um, ideas are kind of being floated around, and probably above and beyond the biggest. So anytime I go to to a, a a talk on OER research or something like that, I'm always the annoying guy at the end of the talk that says something like, "But why? Like, what's the me what's the mechanism behind this?" Um, and I do that just because that's kind of how I was trained to think, um, which is always like, "Why? What? What? What are we? What do we think is underlying this?" As a cognitive psychologist, what we're trying to do is you know I, I don't really care about necessarily how many things a student recalls i want to know why they recalled it so that i can leverage that in the future so that they continue to recall more things or they continue to get more questions correct so why why would somebody um or why would adopting an oer book produce any kind of difference than a non-oer one and there's this this idea that that people kind of implicitly were were telling me which was that well it has to do with access um, and when you look at survey data and you ask students or you even observe what they're doing in their class you'll find a lot of students choose to forego purchasing a book um, because it's too expensive so they get to their course they see that the book is going to cost 200 300 books and like what virginia was saying with her even with her own students is go you know what I'm gonna 
they're going to do what? Well, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to drop the course and just not even try, or they're going to keep going and they're going to do the course without the textbook. And the idea here would be, well, the students that do choose to do the course without their book are going to have a more difficult time than students who do have that resource. And so if you assume that having the resource is beneficial, and I hope that it is, otherwise we wouldn't be spending this much time like building these things, um, then these students are going to be worse off. And then what this is going to do is going to produce a deficit in performance for students using commercial materials. And that by uh, adopting an OER resource that's free or more accessible, you re remove this barrier. Okay, so this seems like, actually, like if you really think about it, what this boils down to is this is just the difference between having a textbook and not having a textbook. It doesn't have anything really to do with OER. It's just, do you have resources available or do you not? Um, continuing at this thought experiment a little bit. Um, okay, so essentially what we're saying is some students in this hypothetical scenario, so you would, um, you, you are in a scenario where you have a commercial textbook, some of your students aren't going to buy it. This isn't going to be 100% of the time, not every, it, you know, it's going to depend on the class, but some of the students aren't going to have access, okay? So when you go ahead and you adopt a, uh, an OER material, what you are doing is you're essentially filling that access gap, but only for those students who didn't, that had that access problem to begin with. So hypothetical scenario, let's say 20% of your students aren't going to buy the textbook or they don't have access to your textbook. The other 80% of students in your class are fine. Um, Obviously, we would still like to save them money because they're, they're students and they have lots of other things to do, but they're going to not have those same um, learning disadvantages. For those 20%, then you do um, potentially improve learning for those students. But if you look at the whole of research on OER, um, we don't really make that distinction most of the time. We look at it as we're going to give people this OER book and compare it to this commercial textbook, and we're gonna kind of make this implicit assumption that it's going to affect everybody equally. But like I just said, in this hypothetical thought experiment, we actually kind of don't think that it's going to. And so the quest, the problem with that is all of those students who I said are not necessarily going to be affected are contributing to our measurement of the effectiveness of this material. And even if your OER adoption is really, really, really effective, or even like moder moderately effective for those students that didn't have access, all of those students that aren't affected are kind of wash out that impact. And so in the end, what you could potentially be seeing is nothing. Um, and then the paper that, that Nathan uh, uh, mentioned was basically um, a way of formalizing this idea. And we ran a bunch of simulation studies to kind of simulate hypothetical scenarios like this where some students in the class don't have access and some do and if we were to actually improve their learning would we actually be able to see it and the take-home message from this paper was um, you might be able to see it but the vast majority of um, studies that have been conducted so far probably would not have been able to see any effect of, of OER even though it very well could have been effective um, and that's, that's, in a nutshell, that's the access hypothesis and that's um, the kind of the reality that it presents to um, researchers in this field. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there and, and kind of turn it back to you, Nathan. Yeah, I, know this, I think that's terribly interesting and I, I definitely if folks have any questions about that, Write them in the chat. I'm. Uh, I'll be recording some questions. We can come back to them. I, I think it's a. It's an interesting. We can talk. We'll talk a little bit about implications of that. But I, I think that's an interesting result. Um, and then Virginia, you. Uh, you know, you just published this uh, huge meta analysis, um, looking at basically research over over a decade of research in OER and specifically on the impact on student learning. Um, and and then and so you kind of did the big analysis that um, Phil is kind of 
was was projecting, you know, or looking, thinking about, but what, what were the results, the bottom line results that you found? Right. So uh, just to clarify, I focused on uh, post-secondary students. So, and I also focused on textbooks and open where not sure if the students had access to the commercial textbook. Um, so for example, there was one experiment that actually was my own where we gave students copies of the commercial textbook and we didn't include that. <clears throat> so what I found looking at 22 different studies across various types of institutions and various content areas and over 100,000 studies is that there was there were equivalent learning outcomes in terms of student performance, which was almost always grades, uh, either the final course grades or exam grades throughout the course. And I mean, really, there's it was a robust lack of a difference. Um, so this is really reassuring for anybody that's worried that an open textbook is going to hurt their students, but you know, it doesn't really fit in with the idea that there's those students who are gonna be helped by a textbook. And I can sp explain a little, I have some um, more conjecture than anything or hypotheses for why that could be. I, I really wanted to look at student characteristics because I think that there are certain students who not only may not afford a textbook, but who would really benefit from one um, more so than just attending class and being really attentive and being really responsible with their work, which is also a major contributor to grades. Uh, but most of the studies just did not provide enough information on student characteristics. And I'd also thought about like, well, maybe I could separate based on assumptions of the general socioeconomic status of the community, but that just really didn't work out as far as um, the, the various schools that were in it. Uh, I did look at some methodological issues. So sometimes the instructor differed between the open and the commercial courses, which instructors obviously not only vary in their teaching quality, but the grading criteria. Uh, I looked at whether or not the exact same assessment was used. So oftentimes if you change a book, you need to change your assessments because the terminology may be a little different or certain ID concepts aren't covered. And then if they incorporated student prior knowledge or achievement into the metrics, <coughs> which I knew from personal experience, which was important because in my own study, I noticed that there were slightly higher grades for the course using an open textbook. But when I got their high school GPAs, I found that they also had slightly higher high school GPAs going into the course. So once that was factored in, there probably was no difference. And if I group studies based on those methodological characteristics, it didn't make a difference. Um, mm. So I also looked at course withdrawal rate, and I found that in 11 studies with over 78,000 students, that there was an impact statistically on course withdrawal rates where open textbooks had lower withdrawal rates than courses with commercial textbook. And that was a pretty robust finding. It, it wasn't driven by any particular study that was included. Uh, and half of these studies, the authors didn't publish the withdrawal rate. Their study was included in the learning efficacy portion of the meta-analysis and I reached out to them and asked if they could share their withdrawal rate. And those who did were included. And there wasn't any difference between people who published their withdrawal rate versus people who didn't look it up until I had requested it. So which, that, which that eliminates part matters because it makes it yeah. less likely that people were just trying to make OER look good. And there's all these what we call file drawer studies with no effects that people were hiding or bad effects that people were hiding. So uh, yeah, my excellent. thinking is for that is that, and this is also just talking to students and getting their take on it. Uh, a lot of times after their first semester, students will wait to see if they need a textbook in a class in order to decide whether to buy it. And, there's actually 
you know, survey and interview data that shows that a de decision to withdraw can be based on the cost of that textbook. If they realize that they do need that textbook, that can be a reason why they would withdraw if they just don't have the money. Another reason is convenience. Uh, if they're able to get an open textbook to be able to catch or get an assignment done, they be, may be more likely to stay up in the class or catch up on the class than if they have to go and access the commercial materials, which is just a more involved process than clicking download from the course learning management system. So interesting. I would say two things I was just really impressed with uh, Virginia's study about. One is the fact that you reached out to all of these researchers and got additional yeah. data. And <laughs> like, I can't imagine the follow up and work that took. And then also, you know, I know I also, it's open I also ed. Yeah. Um, stalked people at Open Ed 2018. <laughs> Stalking is a, is a <laughs> valid research strategy, I think. That's great. Um, so I just think that was really great. And John and his uh, in his presentation at the last uh, John Hilton in his presentation at the last Open Ed definitely shouted out your your study as kind of the thing. If you wanted to pick one to take around and show your administrators and say, "Look, this is what OER does." I think this is the study. So uh, just to highlight that. So given these results and given what you all found, I mean. What does this mean for us? I think we've talked a couple of things, but maybe if we could just bullet very high level kind of what are some takeaways that we should as OER practitioners, folks that are out in the field, what should we take away from this? I'll take a stab first and then I, I'm interested to hear Virginia's take as well. Um, so when I saw Virginia's uh, results from her meta-analysis, I kind of had the, like, yeah, this makes sense kind of feeling, right? Um, if you, based on uh, the access hypothesis stuff and thinking about like, well, what are the me possible net mechanisms in which we might see improvements? This really makes sense um, that, that, that these would be equivalent. Um, the other thing that is important to, to take away is that if we have some other hypothesis too, um, and this is a real hypothesis that's put forward by like commercial publishers a lot, which is that OER materials are lower quality than the commercial ones. And if you believe that, and that very well may be the case, then you would predict in that case that OER um, would perform worse than, um, than the uh, commercial counterparts. And Virginia's study, yeah, pretty much essentially ruled that out. One of the things that Virginia did in her study was really interesting, and I'm so glad that she brought it to the community, which is the introduction of these um, equivalence tests, which are not typically done in educational research at all. Um, this is more of like a, a medical research um, technique, but it's used in research when you're trying to you know, prove to the FDA that your generic drug is uh, the, the same as the commercial drug that's on the market. And so her, her analysis is essentially that sort of thing, saying like, here's this thing, it's essentially the same as, um, as this, uh, this commercial component. Um, I will say like, there's still just, you know, I think we can kind of all rally around this to a certain extent to say like, look, we're certainly not causing any harm. We're saving students money. There's really no reason to not to go this route. And so we're kind of chipping away at all of the traditional arguments against OER. There are still a lot of unanswered questions though um, and things that we don't know. Um, we also don't really even know uh, what usage is like overall, commercial or OER otherwise. So if if all students are really choosing you know, even if they're buying a textbook, if they're not reading it, it doesn't okay. matter. If we give them a free textbook and they're not reading it, it doesn't matter. And so in that case, we would also expect no differences. So we really need to start, um, you know, really chipping away at some of these deeper questions of, all right, well, how is usage different and how does that contribute to differences between these materials? And I think that's kind of where we're sort of at. Virginia, what are your thoughts? Yes, I was gonna, 
Yeah, add on to that one, I have a reviewer to thank for uh, me digging up the non-equivalence test and finding out there was a test of non-equivalence. That was a, a learning process for me in developing my, my skills on this project. Uh, so thank you, anonymous reviewer, wherever <laughs> you are. And I um, asked perhaps a textbook doesn't matter. I personally am not in that. I, I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that. There may be courses that that is the case. You know, upper level courses where you can have collections of readings, or you know, courses where maybe having that isn't important. But I know that students typically like having a cohesive document that kind of guides them through the course, that helps them follow along with the course material. Uh, yes, sometimes they don't read it, and obviously that's not going to make a difference, but, you know, there is a correlation between how much they read the textbook and how well they do in the class. Like, that has been shown in the research. Of course, that can also be because they're more responsible in general, but I do think, yeah, I may be biased because I research text comprehension. I think reading's good, and I think, you know, having a good text to use to as an ancillary for the class or to use during active learning or to use as a reference can be really useful for students. Uh, one thing I've wondered though is again this is more anecdotal and we don't have a lot of information on how the instructors assigned or used the textbook. Um, you know and, and a lot of these reports it just simply said like this many classes use this textbook this many classes use this textbook but there really wasn't a lot of detail on were there assignments where you had to use the books did they have to write reading reactions did they have to take quizzes before class could they have you know just gone to class and taken notes and been fine and you know talk i know that there are some instructors who will flat out tell their students the first day of class you come to class and you take good notes and you pay attention, you don't need to buy that $200 textbook. So in that case, you probably wouldn't see a difference either. Great points. Um, just to kind of summarize, it seems like um, the research has shown, first of all, that we can pretty much do away with that old publisher argument that was made to you, Virginia, so many years, that, that that if you're not paying for the textbook, it can't be as high quality. Right, that, I, that was actively harming my students was basically. Right, right, that you're harming the st your students by providing them with a free textbook. Um, we, I think it's also kind of cool just to see how open research, educational research is, impact, is interacting with educational research at large. And in some ways, maybe open educational research is really influencing that. That's kind of cool. I think the, the emphasis to focus on learning and the instructional practices that are involved and then also pulling student characteristics that those are really interesting, important features to understand the impacts of OER. Um, there's a question in the discussion uh, in, the, in the chat window that um, I, I wanna flag. We are gonna talk a little bit about um, human subject research, but the question specifically talks about using data and analytics on usage and user data. I mean, I think that's a big question that's out there. So I want to flag that. Um, but before, so I, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, the, before we get there, I just want to think about as a lot of the folks here on the call are, um, are kind of in administration faculty at uh, community colleges. Some of them are um, coordinating uh, national programs and, and things and and so how how can folks do uh, set up research studies for themselves I mean, what kinds of things should they be looking at I have a, I have a list of kind of possible questions here that we'll look at but um, I want just maybe if you all can address this area of, of thinking about setting up some good research at at a home institution what should we be looking at Uh, in keeping with the tradition of, I guess, me going first, I'll go ahead and, and uh, chime in. Alphabetical. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think that, uh, like I was saying before, I think some of the areas in which we really need to start chipping away at are some of the 
um, possible uh, edge cases or uh, moderating variables, um, such as like how OER is actually being used. Um, Virginia mentioned um, things like, well, are there differences or changes in the tests from when you change from a traditional book to an OER book? Are the, are the exams staying the same difficulty? But also, you know, how are instructors using these materials differently? Is there anything different about using an OER material versus a traditional one? Um, I think we, we understand that there are certain legal affordances of OER versus commercial books. Um, if you happen to be in um, Jeff Siemens' talk at Open Ed, he presented some interesting uh, survey results from instructors to uh, more or less acknowledge that they use a lot of commercial commercial materials in illegal ways um, that are not necessarily afforded by the licensing, but those publishers aren't really going after um, the instructors to sue them. Although interesting tidbit, um, our local school district, Houston Independent School District recently was subject to a pretty high profile lawsuit involving copyright infringement from a publisher. So I think the, you know that is certainly something to be worried about, but I think in practice what's happening is a lot of the things like remixing and taking out uh, materials from textbooks and putting in the slides and making making your own custom materials that's afforded by the license of, uh, of open materials. Everybody's just kind of doing this anyway with commercial books. So is there actually um, a difference between them? Kind of some interesting. Um, Less areas. opportunity for a lawsuit, I guess. Right. You're gonna, <laughs> they're not going to sue the individual instructor, but I guess if they can go after a, a, an entire school district, then that's fair game because that's okay, I guess. Um, I don't know. Those are my thoughts. Uh, Virginia, what do you think? Yeah. Um, related to that, you know, when I did my study on the commercial textbook, you know, I had a, a, some spaces for open ended responses and one of the comments was the student said I should have told everyone that I could get, they could get a free PDF of the commercial textbook online. I'm like, yeah, the pirated copy. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's illegal. Um, I wasn't. No, I'm not going to stop you, but I I'm not going to encourage you to commit a copyright violation. But apparently, there are faculty on campus who do that. Mm. So. Um, it's not quite common. I don't think they even know that it's illegal. I think, uh, or, or like Jeff Seaman said, they, they think it's fair use or whatever. Right. Yeah. Or it's on the internet. It must be okay to use. <laughs> right. I'm not profiting off of it. So. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point. I mean, we don't know. I think the point you're raising is that there's so much we could do in OER research looking at the specific practices that faculty are engaged in in the classroom. Um, and I think it's a great idea. The, the traditional sort of research questions that at least the OER research group uh, has put out there that I think people gen tend to group around are the, you know, look at cost savings, look at the pass rates and completion rates, the outcomes. This is the stuff we were talking about. And then this usage question, I think this is some of the stuff you all were just talking about. So sort of how is the OER actually used? How are traditional textbooks actually used? Can we compare these, these things? And then the perceptions, you know, what, what are the perceived quality of, the, of, um, of OER? Um, we've also talked then about the, you know, the idea of, of honing in on subgroups, student characteristics that would benefit most from this and how it's implemented um and then broader learning areas are there any other things y'all want to say on these sorts of big kind of research questions that people ought to be thinking about as they're as they're looking at how effective their oer implementation program is on campus well i think one area too is to you know related to the idea of instructors changing their practices is to look at um if using OER has has um, prompted them to maybe be more reflective or to think about their practice, just the opportunity to redesign their course and 
how that relates to their instructional effectiveness. That may be a consideration um, or even just how much they then feel comfortable requiring use of a textbook because they know. I mean, I know I feel completely comfortable requiring all kinds of assignments out of the textbook uh, because I know they you know, have it easily accessible, available to immediately download. So, rely on probably a little bit more as far as assignments and things like that for that reason. And I also think enrollment intensity and persistence and degree completion. You know, a lot of the studies have been relatively short term, but does this make a difference in the number of courses they enroll in? Um, I know there's been an, there's an experimental study that's just out, I think Carrie Cutler is an author, but um, where they randomly assigned students to look at hypothetical classes and they would, they were, you know, choosing to enroll in more classes if the books, if the courses used OER as opposed to. Oh, interesting. I haven't yeah. seen that one. That's I cool. mean, granted that's, um, that's a hypothetical, that's a, you know, controlled mm -hmm. experimental setting, but there is some work. I know John Hilton did a study a while back where he did look at enrollment intensity. And I think that would be an important question, especially when it comes to encouraging university administrators to uh, bankroll a lot of this work. Yeah, that was actually a, a nice, uh, there's a funding model called the intro model for funding sustainability. And it was a Tidewater, I think it was Wiley Hilton and some others. I, it's, it's, a, it's a good article. Um, I, I do want to, I, Phil, I want to ask you this question as well. And then I want to loop back. Cable Green's got a really good comment in the, in the comment, in the chat window. Okay. I want to loop back to the copyright issue, but go ahead. Any thoughts on the, some strategies or things that people ought to be studying? Um, I mean, I think that uh, starting with the why uh, in your research is super critical. So um, what, why do you think uh, this is going to have an impact? And once you, add, once you come up with a hypothesis for why you think it's going to be impactful, design your research around that. So if you have a hypothesis that, um, well, when you adopt OER, more students are going to have access to the book or wouldn't otherwise have access to it, then you have, uh, uh, you can set up your study to really test that idea. And you can say, okay, well, let's look at the students who don't have access. And when we give those particular students access, does that improve their grades? And then when you can design your experiment around that hypothesis, your results are going to be a lot more convincing and they're going to be a lot more powerful um, than if you kind of don't design your study with the hypothesis in mind. So that would be kind of just like a general um, strategy. I do think, um, you know, from the access hypothesis idea, looking at just exactly that, the types of students who are going to be most impacted by that OER implementation and, and trying to do what you can to focus your research there, um, that can be um, very helpful to the research. And as a general strategy too, um, I know a lot of folks here are coming from the um, community college uh, community, um, but there are lots of researchers out there, um, like Virginia and myself, who are, you know, itching to collaborate on these types of things. And so I would also say, don't feel like you need to become an educational research scientist overnight to do these things yourself. Um, you know, we, we are happy to, um, uh, or lots of folks in my field are happy to work with you to, to design a research protocol and um, help hone in on some of those questions. And um, so you can do your study in a way that's going to be um, just rigorous and, and well received when it finally comes out. Yeah, and it, it, it's really an ideal collaboration because you have one person with the research skills background and you have somebody with the institutional knowledge and knowing the students and having that teaching skill and it's just a nice combination of skill sets that benefits everyone and can produce really high quality research. 
it's great. Yeah, I, Y'all are... I, I know personally and knowing about my colleagues, we'd be thrilled if a community college would reach out to us. And I've had some people who um, don't have research positions or extensive research training who have reached out to me and I have collaborated with them happily. That's, out, that's a, such a great point. Let's, I want to talk about that. And, um, but just to loop back to Cable Green's comment about um, copyright, we were talking about the practices of, peop- of educators, you know, either on open licensing, King Ferriers covers them. Cable Green makes a good comment. He says that, um, you know, when educators violate their all rights, the all rights reserved copyright, they not only put themselves and their institution at risk, at legal risk, but it creates legal problems down for downstream users. So I think that's a, I mean, that's a great point that, that in fact, you know, whereas, you know, using pirating materials might work for you or your class, you know, and maybe you can uh, illegally adapt and remix those things, you can't redistribute that and you can't help benefit the community in a way that that pays it forward. So I think that's a that's a, a great um, thing to keep in mind. One thing uh, Cheryl Collier uh, comments also that um, you know Cengage apparently is is um, is is sending out information suggesting that OER content is compromised because it's openly available online and that their test banks aren't compromised. I think Una's response is quite apt that, you know, I mean, there's some website, I don't remember the name of it, but you can go on and get, um, that you can find anybody's tests, basically. I was gonna say, my test understanding are always is online. that every test bank question in existence is online. Yeah, like, so I think, it, yeah. You know, either you can just immediately Google it, or I know that you could get a Chegg account, C-H-E-G-G, and by purchasing that, you have every test bank question from every publisher. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think so, so we should keep that in mind. You know, that we're, even though it's, it's gonna be kind of a bit of a game of whack-a-mole here, we're gonna get crit- criticisms constantly about open educational resources. And sometimes research can resolve those questions and sometimes common sense can. Um, Cable Green also points out, I think this is, something everyone should look into is uh, the, the 10 week certificate, copyright certificate um, program that Creative Commons um, puts on. Um, so that's a pretty pretty rigorous and thorough course that people go through that it's, um, it um, does require tuition payment, but it's a really worthwhile thing. I've not done it myself yet, but I, um, I know some folks who have and they have gotten a lot out of it. Okay. Um, Let's talk about collaborative projects since y'all brought that up. I just, I think it's a huge thing. Um, uh, thanks, Amy. Um, the, Amy Lagers. Um, the, you know, I know I came from this in a, because uh, I come from a background, I have a PhD in philosophy, which where we don't do empirical research. We, our empirical research involves sitting back in an armchair um, and, um, you know, uh, so we don't, so when, when I was thinking about, uh, doing some studies of the OER program, I'm, I administer, I didn't know what to do. And I was just lucky that I happened to be in the OpenStax, um, institutional partnership program and ran into Phil and Phil said, I want to help. I, I can help. And I said, excellent. And so we've worked together and I think we can talk about that process. Um, but Let's start with just some of these questions. This comes, this goes back to uh, the question that was raised earlier regarding data and usage data. Kareen Ulam um, asked this question about how we protect students' data and, and rights, especially in the broader ethos of open, some of those values. So we'll talk to a little bit, who wants to talk a little bit about human subject research and what we should be thinking about there, limitations on that, and then and then we'll talk, I guess we can go through sort of how we would embark on collaboration. Yeah, so I guess I, I see Phil actually has actively commu- uh, collaborated with the community college. I would say first, first step is to talk to your IRB and 
your institutional review board at your campus because um, if you're not in the habit of doing human subjects research, um, a lot of policies in terms of student data vary by institutions and sometimes state laws vary. So knowing what the guidelines are for your particular institution is um, important going forward. So for example, I was able to get this, my students' grades from my particular course because I was, I was the instructor um, and I was able to use those in my research yeah, but I needed to however for their high school GPAs I could only get the course mean and standard deviation I couldn't get the individual student information without individual signed releases so like that's an example where the student data varies a little bit depending on what exactly I was asking um, but I could also ask for self-reported high school GPAs. That was totally fine. Cool. And don't be scared of your institutional review board. I know people have uh, horror there stories to help. sometimes. They're there to help. I, I was kind of unsure about it, but they've working with them has been really great. So, Phil, you were going to say. Yeah, no, I mean, I was going to echo essentially what you both just said, which is that um, it's not they're not only there just to review protocols that you submit to them but also to answer questions about research ethics and things like that that you might have and navigate some of the legal issues um and so you can approach them and, and ask like when when do like when do i need to um get informed consent for these things or how can i um obtain that data and they'll, they'll help you navigate those waters um beyond that obtaining student records like Virginia said, it really depends on your your use um, and how you're accessing that data, and it's going to be um, it's going to be dependent on your specific uh, research questions and um, how you're using that data. Um, so, you know, if you need to identify that data versus not identify that data, those are going to be totally different things. Um, or getting an aggregated means analysis versus getting individual subject line data. Um, but yeah, so they'll be able to um, help you with those uh, issues. Um, and then, you know, um, with the collaborative projects like we set up with HCC and Rice University, universities are rightfully very protective of their students' data. So HCC, who are, um, you know, the students in our uh, collaborative project that we're working with are students at HCC. HCC has the privacy of their students um, in mind, and so they want, they don't want to just hand over data at any any institution and so there was a long um, uh, process between our, our two institutions putting together a data sharing policy specifying exactly how the data would be used how we would store the data how we would make sure that students privacy was protected how would we make sure to um, protect against potential um, releases of the data and so we specify how we actually do that and then eventually sign an agreement and then uh, uphold those agreements. And so these things can't happen. Um, you know, it should not happen or should not be taken lightly. We'll just put it that way. Um, and it's really important that you make sure you know what you're doing and that you're doing it um, with um, the approval of uh, possible uh, owners of the data. Yeah, that's a good, good question. I mean, if you're going to have any kind of cross institutional collaboration, you're going to have to go through the process. You're going to have to get to know not only that have IRBs that approve, that accept the IRB review of another institution or, or do their own in conjunction with it, you're also going to have to consult with your general counsel and probably some higher level administration who needs to sign off on that stuff. It can be a process, but once you navigate it, it gets a little easier. Um, and it does I mean, just, it really does vary a lot by institution. I've had some institutions, and this is for a different project where we're developing a reading test for college students. I've had some institutions being like, oh, you don't need any kind of approval to recruit from our students if an instructor is willing to share the recruitment materials i'm like okay <laughs> and i've had other places where they refuse to let us um recruit because they valued student privacy to the point where 
they didn't want students voluntarily giving their email addresses to us. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Those that's are the wow. Two extremes wow. I've wow. Had. That is extreme. Um, some, uh, yeah. So we're, we're about five minutes out. So um, I have one last question I wanted to just maybe loop back to. Kareen is asking again about um, usage data. I think typically usage studies have been in the past um, through surveys. Uh, that's yeah, typically surveys of faculty. Is that, yeah, surveys of faculty or surveys of students and asking sort of how they use the textbook. Uh, is that comport with yeah, what you Yeah, like I basically said, do you need to prepare before the exams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Phil, I know yeah. you're doing, I don't want to, I know you're doing some data with OpenStax because you have a, um, you have a um, learning, um, sorry, you have some, some software that actually provides homework stuff. So there's some of that going on. Anything you want to say just really generally about how you, about data privacy kind of considerations? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to Kareen's point, or, or to clarify uh, what Kareen is asking about a little bit more, I'm speaking more of like from a theoretical perspective, here are the things that we want to be looking at usage and how that relates to outcomes and, and how maybe differences in usage between OER and commercial. There are a wide variety of ways in which you could actually address this. Um, I think you give us specific examples of like, okay, well, we could possibly collect um, user information such as clicks. That would be one way of doing it. Self-reported data would be another way of doing it. Um, all of these things, you're going to have to kind of weigh, you know, what are the privacy and ethical considerations for doing that? If you want to go ahead and collect actual user data, like clicks and things like that, you need to be doing things like making sure your people are informed that you're actually doing it, they're agreeing to this, they can opt out of doing that, or you've got approval from your institutions, or you're doing the data anonymously. You need, there's all, there's a million different levers and switches that you need to be considering, and uh, ultimately like, um, oh, and then the point about, yeah, how does this fit into an open ethos? I think all of this ultimately comes down to um, being open about what you're doing. Uh, so there's a, a movement now in the research community called Open Research, um, and there's an open research initiative, and uh, we are currently starting our process of moving everything that we're doing in OpenStax over to the uh, uh, Open Science Framework, which is from the Open Research Initiative, um, which will eventually kind of show all the things that we're doing or we're currently working on, give information about our IRBs, how we're protecting user data, that sort of information, um, let people know what we're doing, what we're working on and then building in lots of consent mechanisms and things like that. But it's this very, very super important question, a very important issue, I totally agree. Awesome, um, so I wanna wrap up here by just uh, sharing with you all some links um, that you can find some of this information. I will, I'm linking to three, the three articles, the two that we discussed, and then also John Hilton's um, review of the literature um, that gets published. This is his most recent publication in August of this year, covering research from 2015 to 2018. Um, in the chat window, I think there was some mention of the Open Ed Group. Uh, this is a great website and a great research group web, web, um, resource. Uh, John Hilton is the director of that group. It's housed at BYU. They, um, they invite the OER research fellows. Virginia mentioned that um, earlier. They also have some great tools on the website, the OER research toolkit, which includes even like sample survey questions and things you could implement. Um, Lumen Learning's developed this adoption impact calculator that I think is really cool and addresses some of the enrollment intensities type stuff that we we're talking about in the cost factor. And then John maintains a, a live sort of um, review project that kind of feeds into his public published reviews. Um, so as far as CCCOER, just uh, want to encourage you to stay in the loop. Um, get on our email list, the listserv. Um, and um, I didn't mention this, but we are soliciting um, blog uh, posts, case studies, and, and also anything on the equity, diversity, and inclusion topics. 
If you're interested in that, please reach out to Una Daly or Liz Yata. Um, and um, then our fall webinar series is wrapping up. This, is, this was the penultimate um, webinar. The next one will be December 4th, uh, looking at conference recaps and reflections on open ed and OE Global. Um, and then also just announcement about the Open Education Global Conference uh, taking place uh, in a few weeks in um, Milan. Um, you know, I'm sad to miss it. But uh, very maybe... much kicking myself that I learned about it too late. Yeah, definitely. So save up your travel money for next year and come to OE Global. That's the Open Education Consortium. Um, that's a um, If you have any questions, contact information is here. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to our guests. I really appreciate the conversation and look out for the recording on YouTube. All right. Thanks, y'all.